Think of this function, this very special function, h k of q of q. And I said that it satisfies a dynamical system. Namely that q prime, which is dq by dt, so prime as usual is d by dt, satisfies partial h by partial t, and d prime, or dt by dt, satisfies minus partial h by partial t. And then I asked you to show that such a dynamical system emits no sources or sinks. That was the one. So the way to do it is Google has told the majority of you. Um, is this what? So suppose that your equilibrium point, I will denote by P star. Q stop, let's say. Or P0, Q0, doesn't matter. And further, because this is a dynamical system, I will have F1 as usual, denote the right hand side of the first one, so dh by dt, and F2 as minus dh by dt. So just like how I've been doing my analysis for every other one. Okay. Okay, then I simply want to determine the stability properties of this point, Q star, P star, so I write down my Jacobian which is still the standard one. So df1 by dq, df1 by dp, partial f2, partial q, partial f2. And now you have f1 and f2 as partial derivatives. So you get second derivatives here. So this is minus partial square h, partial q squared. And obviously I want to evaluate this at my point. So q star p. So I just denote that by a bar. And I will evaluate. Now you just determine the eigenvalues, but the trick is now, these are just numbers now, because I'm evaluating each partial derivative at a specific point. So therefore they are just numbers, so I can denote them by whatever you want to denote them by. So let me denote by some letter A, partial square H, partial P, partial Q. And by the equality of mixed partials, this is equivalent to the, in the reverse direction. Okay. And further, I will denote by B, partial H squared, partial P squared, and by C, partial H, partial P squared. And each one of these partial derivatives are evaluated at my point P star. Yes? So, uh, I want to know that there should be some condition for switch all the Fubini's theorem. Yes, so there's some condition. Let's continue. And uh, I don't remember if you mentioned that. Say it again. So I don't know if you remember that you notice that that condition in your impression. So for us, for this to be continuous. Yes. I didn't write it, but I assume they're continuous. I always assume things are continuous. That's my bad habit. It's not a good habit. But for this question, assume it's good. Actually, I'll show you why it's okay at the end. That's the second thing I wanted to know. Remember I said two things? So let me write down this one. Okay. So anyways, but each one of these points, entries are evaluated as a point, so therefore I can simply write J is equal to A, B, C, and minus A. Just now. And now it's trivial to compute the eigenvalues, because you know how to do this now. So you get lambda squared minus a squared minus bc is equal to zero. But of course, that means that your two lambdas, one and two, are plus or minus square root a squared plus b. So right away, you see that necessi by necessity, the two eigenvalues at the most basic level 
must be of opposite side. So by default, you get a circle. So in other words, there's three cases. So in the first case, if a squared plus bc is greater than zero, then you get two real eigenvalues of opposite signs. So you get what? A seven. The other case is if a squared plus b squared of bc is equal to zero. In this case, you have two zero eigenvalues, which means you have a two-dimensional center manifold, so a center input. And a squared plus bc less than zero, so this is a complex eigenvalue. Complex conjugate. And this is that center equilibrium. So that corresponds. In other words, you don't get sources of six. Okay. So such a system defined as that only with saddles or centers, no sources of six. It's very special. So this is the other, so is everybody clear on this so far? Yes. What is that? It's two zero eigenvalues. Yes. That's an R in there. If you can believe it. <laughs> okay, so this is just straightforward computation. But my question is, did anybody go beyond this? Beyond the Google answer? No, okay. Let's see what I mean by it. Why am I saying, since I introduced this problem a week ago, that it's a very special system? Look what happens when you do something. What, what board can I raise out of this? So, it is clear that P and Q are two functions of time, right? Otherwise, I could not write dP by dt and dQ by dt. So, in other words, my H function is HP of T, Q. What happens if I take the total differential of H with respect to time? In other words, what happens if I compute dh by dt? By the chain rule, this is partial h by partial p dp by dt plus partial h by partial q dq by dt. This is partial h. What is dp by dt? Which is? And what is dq by dt? Ah. So what is this equal to? Oh. That's very interesting. Such a function defined by this dynamic system, when you take its total differential with respect to time, is zero. H is constant. What is significant about this? So that is determined. That's the determinant of the Yes, but what is significant about so physics students would see this right away. But you're supposed to see this. Maybe not the modern day physics students. The ones that have computers and energy. So no. No, no, it's not. It's it's close. It's very close to it. Very close to this. Okay. The point is as follows. But dh by dt is definitely zero. In other words, h is constant. So in physics or physical application, q of t represents the position of some object or particle in time. <coughs> P of T is its momentum. Question. Yes. Question. Oh, sorry. 
cue and clear the position and momentum of a particle in phase space. H then represents the total energy of the system. So H of P of Q is the total energy of the system, which is called the Hamiltonian. And by showing that, irrespective of what P and Q are, that dH by dt is always zero, we are making a statement of conservation of energy. It implies that H is constant. And it means that the energy of the system is constant. There's something else here now. All the solutions lie along these curves, h is equal to zero, or constant. What is the solution of dh by dt is equal to zero? h is constant. So all the solutions of my dynamical system, they lie along these circles in my center point. So remember I drew this here. So this is p and this is q. All my solutions lie along these circles. They're constant. So you start here, you come back here, come back here. So h of t is constant. So there's something very deep about this question, actually, that nobody got because they just lose it. No, I'm sure. Maybe I'm discouraging you too much. Maybe I should do the question. Did you see it? No. <laughs> And curiosity, why are you using momentum versus that? There's a very deep reason why. Okay. I was wondering if you want. Um, well, it, it's, it's a bit unusual, but that's all. But just it's, it's actually not momentum that we're using, it's velocity. But let me see. Well, velocity, I could understand. Um, there's two ways to describe a mechanical system. So, in mechanics, you can take what is called a Lagrangian approach. And you can take a Hamiltonian They are equivalent. How you get from one to the other is what you call a Lagrangian transformation. But that's too technical, you don't need to do it. There's two ways to describe the mechanics of the system. In the Lagrangian approach, you have a function called a L, which describes the dynamics of the system in terms of its position, q dot, which is velocity of the time. In the Hamiltonian approach, which is just what I showed you, it's momentum, position, and time. The reason is as follows. If you had your phase space here, What you actually learn is that momentum belongs in the cotangent space. So remember in our manifold we have tangent spaces, cotangent I didn't tell you about the cotangent space. If I have a bunch of curves that represent the position of my particle of time, the time period at some point is going to be the velocity, q dot. But that's in the tangent space. Think about it. If I have a bunch of curves in my manifold tangent to that time, is my velocity. What I did not tell you, there's also something called the cotangent space. And that cotangent space is a dual vector space of the tangent space. And that dual vector space is where your momentum vector is built. So, in the Lagrangian approach, you have q and q dot, which are your manifold oops, and your tangent space to the manifold. Actually, so t then. In the Hamiltonian approach, you still have your manifold here, but the momentum now is in what we call T star, which is the dual vector space. So that's why. It's a geometric approach. And if you keep going in this direction, what you get is two geometric approaches to describing the dynamics of any mechanics. So that's why. Momentum is actually a very natural way to think of mechanics. Because it allows you to tie all these things together. 
And the point is that in the Hamiltonian approach, you get, as you've seen now, q dot is dh by dt. Q p dot is minus dh by dt. And this completely describes the dynamics of your system. In the Lagrangian approach, and these, of course, are called Hamilton's equations. In the Lagrangian approach, you have something called an Euler Lagrangian. But that would just could be right for you. So you have the Euler Lagrangian. Everybody's wondering what exactly I'm doing right now. Um, but it's the same. So d by dt partial L by partial Q is equal to partial So two equivalent ways of describing the mechanics of this. Either way, you get a bunch of ordinary different So both are very relevant to dynamical systems. If it was up to me, I would do this in this course. But I cannot do it because you're not interested in it. So I must stop. <laughs> but anyways, you can the point maybe of your original question was you can equivalent describe any physical system either by in terms of its velocity and position coordinate or its position and momentum coordinate. In this case, it's what we call configuration space. And in this case, it's what you call and I should make the following point. If you're interested in quantum mechanics, in terms of substructures, then this is the more natural picture, because it's much easier to quantize this than it is to quantize it. So that's why. Anyway. Um, but that is my hope of what you would have took, taken away from the whole discussion. But I don't know. What um, any questions about this? Before I go back to biology, yes. What's the, is the legend of the Jordan transformation? So, in other words, if you decide to describe your mechanics as a Lagrangian, mm -hmm. but I want to do things in Hamiltonian, the Lagrange transformation is a dictionary of how I can translate my math to yours. Okay, back to boring problems. Any questions about this? I don't know why you do it. No So that's how let's say is your boundary approach. So let's say for your uh, rational theories. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that any any questions? Yes. So you think that these two and these two ways can also describe Safe, uh, mechanic, uh, mechanic yes, yes. So for, for, for quantum mechanics, there's two ways to choose forms. Yeah. And that is the way to transform the first half. The Lagrangian approach in quantum mechanics is much more difficult than the other. Hamiltonian is much nat natural because I can quantize the operators much easily. In the, in the Lagrangian formulas, I have to use something called a path integral approach, which you will do in quantum field theory if you go higher and higher. But it's always easier to do that. Yeah. Okay. Well, we, we can talk about it more after if you want. Maybe on your final exam, I'll give you a question. Why not? Yeah. You should be able to do it. It's all dynamical systems, right? No, I, I will not. Okay, so I have no idea now where I left off last time. Um, but I think we're doing the SIR model. And I left you with the problem of bifurcation. Let me recall. Okay, so. I left you last time. Yeah, I just wrote it down, didn't I? Okay, so what I said was that I had this solution for equilibrium points I equals to zero, which was my line. And I said it is a local sink 
if S is between 0 and B over B. And I said it's a source if S is greater than B over B. So that's where we left off. So I said that the important point is now because we have a bunch of three parameters now in our dynamical system, the stability changes depending on the signs now of here we get local source and source is the same. Here's a bank of looking So you can see now it's not numbers anymore like before. The behavior changes depending on the signs of V and V and the values of V and V as well. Okay. So whenever you have three parameters in your equation, that leads to the phenomenon of what we call bifurcation. So three parameters lead to the phenomenon of bifurcation. And bifurcation is just a fancy word for what? Changes in the stability of your dynamics. Very interesting. Question? Well, is the definition splitting? Bifurcation? Uh, splitting. That's one way to think of it. Um, in terms of you can just say for the English yeah. word. Yes, yes, yes. Splitting. Splitting. And you can think of it in that way too. If this is some critical value, and depending on which way you split it, you'll get a source of something. You get two different results. Exactly. So it's the same. I guess it comes from this. That's a good point. Okay. But the question is if I give you a dynamical system, with a bunch of free parameters, how do you detect these bifurcations? Without actually having to go and solve or do anything. So, detect bifurcations. How do you do it? It's going to involve the Jacobian. Obviously, anything we do involves the Jacobian. But what we want to actually look at is the linearized system in the neighborhood of my equilibrium form. So in this case, I believe I called it I star S star. And what does that mean? That means the problem. So if you recall, my Jacobian was what? My Jacobian, if you recall, um, at i equals to 0, if you remember, my Jacobian matrix was 0 minus beta s, 0 beta s minus. Just rewrite. Okay. But remember I said the Hartman Grogan theorem. It allows you to write the linearized version of your system. So in other words, it converts x prime is equal to fx to some other x prime equal to j x. And that's what you call the linearization. So what should the linearized system look like at this point? If you do it, it's the same idea. So in other words, we have x prime is equal to jx. But this is the same as s prime i prime is equal to that j matrix and s i. And now you can just read off what the linearized system is. So that's the first step, is to write down your linearized system of where you want to analyze the bifurcation. So in front of the linear systems, we use the matrix A here, we're using J. Exactly, exactly, exactly. But you see, in the linear system, in the linear case, that A was true at any point. This J depends on what point I'm considering, because it's the nonlinear system. So it's linearized in the neighborhood of I equals to zero. So that's the key. So what should, if I follow this through, 
what should my linearized system be? At, and this is the key point, at i equals to 0. It looks like follows. So you just read it off. So s prime is equal to minus b at i, and you get i prime is equal to beta s minus b. So that's the linearized system in the neighborhood of i equals to 0. So this is the first step, is to obtain the linear equation. Okay? And now, to find the bifurcations, you just see where these equations are equal to 0. So that's the <coughs> Find values of the parameters, so beta and b, <coughs> such that either S prime or I prime is equal to or both. So right away, you can see that there's two possibilities for a zero zero. Either you have that, so S prime is equal to zero, if what? If beta is equal to zero, and I prime is equal to zero, if what? S is equal to B over B. So, in other words, the key thing about the bifurcations are happening when at this line here, B over B. And you can see it from the eigenvalues. There's something very significant about B over beta, that the whole system changes as you change this ratio. And you get it from this bifurcation. So another one. And what we say then, therefore, so the proper way to write this out is you say that S destabilizes the equilibrium point when beta is equal to zero. And you say that I destabilizes the equilibrium point when S is equal to B or B. That's the problem with this thing. So, what you conclude then, conclusion, <coughs> is there is a bifurcation line at B over B. And the system changes stability depending on this specific ratio, B over B.
may have been reinfected with some winter disease. And this is common in cases of malaria and even a tuberculosis infection. Well, it's not common, but it happens. So, the key assumption then is we have assumed that the uh, rate of recovered individuals Or maybe I should say rate of return of recovered individuals to the S category, the susceptible category, um, occurs at a rate proportional to the population. of recovered individuals. I think my arm has given up on writing words at some point. So if you cannot read anything, let me know. Right now it feels like you're making brush strokes or something like this. There's no uh, feeling in my shoulder. I don't know why. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I feel like <laughs> That's the perfect, uh, but I, I don't know who would be Mr. Miyagi in this context. I need to know. So you don't get now an SIR model, you get what is called an SIRS model. And the extra S is just the uh, return of the reinfected. In other words, they go back into the susceptible group. So that's why you have an extra S now in parentheses. Okay. So now you get an extended system of equations. So you get your S prime equation minus BSI minus mu R. So mu is our new parameter now that describes this rate of return. So mu is this new parameter. It's related to that last sentence as well. You get an I prime equation, which is beta as I minus B I, so B is the same as before. And you get an R prime equation, which is B I minus mu. So this is my dynamics. That's mu. Yeah. That's my mu constant here. So mu describes the rate of return of the infected people back into the system. He did not agree. He disliked my mu parameter. <laughs> Who has a question? Oh. Yeah, I oh. So, but the assumption, once again, is that the population is still constant. So, in other words, S plus I plus R prime is still equal to zero, so the population is still constant. This time, though, I will be a little bit more fancy, and I will denote this constant by some other parameter called tau. Once I get to my Greek friends, who have made math so incredibly messy to read. <laughs> no, but uh, I don't know actually how would you do it without these things. Could you even do it? Yeah. Like yeah. <laughs> okay. So now with this constraint equation. I can eliminate one of the variables, like I did for my rock paper scissors. So in other words, I will eliminate R because I do not like that. 
So another way to get r is equal to tau minus s. So I will limit r for my dynamical system, and I'll get two equations. I get s prime is equal to minus beta s pi plus mu tau minus s plus pi. And I get in my prime equation beta s i minus b. So this is my reduced system, which is a two-dimensional system, so it's easier to work as you're about to find. Any questions? Okay, so that's our system. What do we do now to analyze this system? Can you just assume that it is negative? See, that's what I originally thought. No, but we want you to be positive. We want all my parameters to be positive. So I'm wrong. But maybe not. I'll come back on Friday and prove me all wrong. No, I'm just sure. Okay. So what is the first step in analyzing a dynamical system? What do I do? You should tell me now. I should not ask you. But to save you some steps, I will show you that the equilibrium points are as follows. You get two equilibrium. Algebra is here on this page, but I'm saving you the time. So you get one. Is equal to delta r b over beta j. And you get this other really weird looking one. Mu tau minus b over beta divided by d plus one. That's one equal. If you solve it, it's easy to solve it because it becomes analogous to solving the new system. It's just algebra. So that's one equilibrium point. The other equilibrium point you get is incredibly simple. Now what do you do that you have the equilibrium? Now you can imagine the nightmare of this. You'll see. Even for this case, it's not nice. But we will not need it. So once again, step two is to compute the eigenvalues associated to each equilibrium point. So I will do the Jacobian. So D F1 partial S, partial F1 partial I, partial F2 partial S, partial F2 partial I. And once again, you get a bunch of x. So minus I beta minus mu, minus S beta minus mu, I beta minus V plus S. And now I want to evaluate each point, um, the Jacobian in each point. So let me do actually the second point first. Or let me do the first point first, actually. So let me do this one, the harder one. Actually, it'll be easier if I do the second point first because the algebra is much easier. So let me do point two. So at point two, you see the Jacobian just becomes minus mu, minus tau, beta, minus mu, 
zero minus v plus r. And the eigenvalues you can read off, actually, because of the nice zero of the So you get once again two eigenvalues. Namely, that lambda 1 is equal to minus mu, and lambda 2 is minus v plus b. Okay. So, this is for the point 2, where s star i star is tau and So the question is now, is this point a sink or a source or a saddle? Once again, it depends on the size of my. Okay. As usual, this is mine. Now, mu, beta, tau, and b are all positive parameters. So lambda 1 will always be negative, no matter what. So, <coughs> we have some possibilities, just like before. So this is a sink. If Lambda 1 is less than 0, and lambda 2 is less than 0. In other words, 2 negative eigenvalues, as usual. So clearly, lambda 1 is always going to be less than 0, because we're assuming that mu is 0. OK, that's fine. But lambda 2 being less than 0, implies that minus v plus v tau is less than zero. In other words, if you fool around with these inequalities, what you get is beta must be less than zero. So, but look at this for a second. Is this a valid condition if you look at the whole system? I'm assuming that S, I, and R are always positive values. If I indeed insist, even though this is not the point I'm concerned about, but if I insist that beta should be less than B over tau, this will go to negative. I cannot have a negative equilibrium. So I must ignore this statement. So in other words, this point is never a thing of the physical system. Yes? Oh, because we are assuming that S, I, and R are proportions of population. So we do not want a negative population. So I cannot set, because if I set beta to be less than V over tau here, this will go to a negative population. So we must ignore. So in fact, this is never a single. Okay. So then there are only two other possibilities. Oh, it's only three twenty. I didn't know. Okay. It's obviously never a source because one eigenvalue is always negative. So the only remaining possibility is that it's a source. And in fact, it's a set of if lambda 2 is greater than 2. Because lambda 1 is always less than 0. So lambda 2 is greater than 0 is what? If beta is greater than b. So that's one condition. And I will finish this for you on. Right. I did not realize that. But the key point here is what? No, I. I um, so Mathematically, it's a sink in terms of the numbers you get. But it's actually still got it. It won't work, because you will not have a negative. Uh, it will just not be a sink. It will just go towards the center.
I really want to make this. Um, if I saw the verse here, I would have grabbed it. I gotta go.